أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we'll start chapter 14 inshallah we'll uh, do the Q&A at the end if that's okay inshallah in chapter 14 we have three separate topics that we would like to discuss the first one is prepaid expense the second one is intangible assets and the third one is property plant and equipment and they're all three of these are you know very different the auditing of these three are very different. So we'll start with the easiest one, which is the prepaid expense. And we'll discuss what prepaid expenses are. We'll discuss the inherent risk assessment, and then we'll discuss the control risk assessment. Prepaids are simple, and they are usually small in, in amount, and they do not have long history or long future use. They're usually, a, you know, always current assets. So seldom do we do substantive procedures or substantive analytical procedures. We just try to see whether the client is accounting for them properly and if we are happy, we move on. So we have the definition of current assets, anything that is going to benefit the client for 12 months following the balance sheet date. So one year life is what we have for the current assets and the prepaids are always listed as current assets. For example, prepaid rent. You pay the rent for three months, six months, uh, you know, one year, and it's expensed once every month. Same could be for any service or any uh, maintenance that you pay for in advance. And very simple. You just take and divide that with the number of months and expense one part every month. And the inherent risk uh, related to the prepaids are generally low because there is no complex or contentious accounting issues. There is nothing complicated in this transaction, nor there is anything contentious, meaning anything that the auditor and the client's accountant would debate about. If it is prepaid for three months, it should be expensed over three months. There is no second opinion about this. This is very straightforward. So there would not be any contention between the auditor and the client that what should it be, right? It's very straightforward and the inherent risk is very low or there is no inherent risk at all actually. And the controlled risk uh, is dependent upon the client's handling of the prepaid and this is normally processed through the purchasing process meaning when you are auditing the purchasing process the client has paid for the goods and services using the purchasing process there is a purchase order there is payment all of those you have already audited in the purchasing process and the control procedures in the purchasing process should also ensure that each item is properly authorized and recorded. So you can see the job of this is already done in the purchasing process. What you do here is you just check the balance to make sure that the balance is right. So let's say the client paid for 12 months of rent in advance at the beginning of July. So at the end of December, only six months should be in the prepaid expense. The other six months should have been expensed. If that is the case, the amount is correct and you move on. Very simple. Is that clear? This is one of my favorite accounts to audit because of, or check. It is very easy and you can, you know, you have, you can be sure right that this is there when you check the accuracy you also check the existence you know you also check all of it can be done and this is not you don't have to go assertion by assertion for this because this is usually one or two items and all the evidences are there you see the payments made you see the payment made to a particular uh, company very you know just one or two things to do right so you can check the you can check the entire transaction in 10 minutes you follow right so this is one of the things 
you know, I would like to check in the balance sheet whenever I went to the clients, when I picked up a client's file, because it's very small, you can, you know, do a quick check mark in the morning to feel that you have done something, etc., etc. Because if you go into cash, you know, the first thing in the uh, current assets, if you start with the cash, you know, cash could be, as you have seen in the previous chapter, very hectic, right? You follow? So cash is listed as the first current assets, asset, then the accounts receivable, then inventory, etc., etc. All of those are very hectic accounts. Prepaid is a very simple, short and sweet, quick. You can, you know, put a check mark that you know, I check this account, everything is right, and so forth, sign and so forth, and feel well about yourself. You follow what I'm saying, right? Okay. The second thing is in this chapter, the intangible assets. We'll define what intangible assets are. We'll discuss the inherent risk assessment, the control risk assessment, and the substantive procedure. Now, uh, let's start, and I will tell you what we need to do here. Intangible assets provide long-term economic benefits, and they lack physical substance, meaning you get benefit, your client gets benefit from the intangible asset, but there is nothing physical. There is no physical substance. It's all paperwork, right? It's, it's, it's your client's right. It's their hack. It's their right to get benefit from the intangible assets. For example, the first one is trademark. All of you know what trademarks are. Nike, Toyota, Mazda, you know, all of these companies, they have their trademark, right? And these trademarks cannot be used by any other company because they are registered. And if somebody else uses them, your client can sue them in the court. They can have a lawsuit, a court case against them, and they can win if they can prove that the company have used your client's trademark. So they are registered and they cannot be copied. Okay. And if somebody copies something very close to what your client has, that also can be taken to court. Okay. Brand name, for example, Starbucks, Marks and Spencer, you know, all of these are registered. You cannot, nobody else can use those names. And they usually have a quality that come with them. So if you see that brand name, some of the brand names have earned the reputation for quality by providing good products and services over the years. So no one else can use their name when they start their company or something close even, right? If they do, then, for example, Nike, somebody uses Heike or, you know, some stupid stuff like that can be taken to court. But usually Nike is so big and customers are so aware of their brand name and quality and so forth, they don't bother with those uh, small flies that try to copy them. Customer relationships can be an intangible asset. And I'm going to give you an example uh, of what, what this is. You know, I worked for a CPA firm for about eight years. I started in 99 May, and I, I the first day was 7th May 1999, and my last day was 15th January 2007, so almost eight years. And I resigned January 1st of 2007, and I gave them 15 days to, you know, put somebody else in my position whom I would, uh, you know, explain everything to and you know transfer over the clients that that I, I was serving and I also informed my clients that I was going to leave the firm and I was going to start my own firm and uh, they would be served by someone else some of these clients wanted to come along with me to my firm that I was going to start now my question to you is first question to you is would it have been okay for me to take those clients and take them to my new firm and, you know, provide them with service? Would that be okay? Would that have been okay? What do you think? Sharat says, no. Anyone else? Anyone else listening? The answer to this question is no, and 
I had a, a contract with the firm that I was working with that I would not take any clients with me if I left the firm. And the clients could come to me after one year of me leaving the firm. So I told my clients that I assured them that they would be given a good service even after I left and they would have someone serving them who is better than me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if they still wanted to come to me, I could take them after one year, but not immediately. And I left the firm. So customer relationships are, there is some value. And I could have taken, for example, if I had taken only 10 clients, for example, that would have been enough for me. I could have survived by serving 10 clients and then look for other clients. But if I had taken 10 clients, my firm would have not come after me and, and taken, to, taken me to the court, etc., etc., etc. But it is gentleman's agreement. As a gentleman accountant, I could not, and I would never do that. I, I learned and I gained so much from that firm. I would never do that. Uh, even if I, have, you know, if I left on bad terms, I left on very good terms, and I still have a very good relationship. My PhD uh, subjects for my study came from the firm. And just last semester, my boss made a presentation in my MBA class. So I have very good relationship with them. But even if I left without uh, having a good relationship, I would not take any of their clients because it's just very lowly to do, right? It's not a good thing to do. So these are uh, valuable, intangible assets because it, because it takes time to build the customer relationships. So it is unethical to sell them or take them and use for a personal benefit, right? The next is copyright. Copyright is uh, on published material. So if you publish something as an author, if anybody wants to uh, cite what you have said, they must give full citation and reference to your work. And if they don't do, then that is copyright violation. And another interesting story uh, from my own experience, you know, my dissertation that I had done, PhD dissertation, back in 2011, it was 100 or so pages, and it is uh, available at the University of Memphis's depository. You can get it from their library. Now, if uh, somebody wants to cite, they have to cite the work. They have to give reference to the work. One of... Uh, what happened, someone uh, wrote a research paper, did a research study, and they took lines from my dissertation and they just plugged them into their work and they sent it for publication to a journal. You know, out of thousands of reviewers that it could go to, it went to my dissertation chair, uh, Professor Bailey, and he looked at, he was as he was reading, those lines sounded very familiar to him because he read my dissertation many times. And he emailed me and he said, you know, these lines just sound there from your dissertation. Can you check? So I checked and those lines were exactly from my dissertation and there was no citation of my dissertation. So I told him that, you know, this is, this is from my dissertation on page number 89 and so forth. So my uh, professor rejected that paper and said that this is copyright violation. This cannot be published. So small world. But just to give you an example, you know, uh, <laughs> how people get caught. You know, subhanAllah, it's unusual, but it happened, subhanAllah. So you get the idea about the copyright. Franchises are rights to uh, use the name of a particular company and operate under their brand name. For example, you can open a McDonald's or a KFC or a Subway restaurant, and you can use their brand name and their uh, logo and operate, but you have to buy their franchise. So you pay them $25,000, for example, and they give you five years. Uh, contract that you can use five years, you can buy the right for five years. After five years, if you want to continue, you can renew. And this would allow you to use their name, but you also have to follow their guidelines. You have to use their menu, you have to use their uniform, you have to uh, maintain the quality control that they ask you to do. So you have to follow all the guidelines. And if you do, then you can use. Franchise fees are usually for a period of time and they expire with the period of time, you have to pay again a renewal to continue the franchise. Franchise fee is one of the easiest intangible assets to 
value because the amount that is paid is known and the period for which it is used is also known. So you can easily calculate the amortization and you can easily record the transactions. There is no debate. But these other ones, there is, you know, not a certain way of accounting. There could be some debate between the accountant and the accountant of the client and the auditor. Patented technology is also another intangible asset. So if, the, if a company comes up with a technology, new technology, they can patent it. So nobody can copy it for a period of time. And after that period expires, others can also start using that. Because as soon as a company comes up with, for example, a phone or a, or a TV or something like that, the competitor can buy that product open and see what is inside and they can copy that technology in a month or a, a week but they cannot because it's patented and they have to wait until the patent expires this is also true for certain medications etc cetera, etc cetera. so this again uh, you know there was a court case between iPhone and Samsung iPhone sued Samsung that they had uh, violated the patent right, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there was a court case in California. There was another one in, in China, I think. So, you know, uh, these things happen. This is real, real stuff, and it is difficult to determine because of the uh, use of the technology how much sale did iPhone lose or how much sale did Samsung gain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, difficult uh, accounting situations. Do you follow? Are you following? Okay, so because of the difficulty, the inherent risk is high because the accounting rules are complex and the transactions are difficult to audit. And I'm not going to be able to teach you a detail of any one of these intangible assets because we do not have time nor is there a need because you may not face the audit of any one of these intangible assets. The one that you're going to face, you're going to learn about it when you go into uh, do the audit. The two intangible assets that I had experience with are franchise fees and goodwill. Right? These are the two that we have recorded and I have some knowledge and again uh, you know, nobody has perfect knowledge because the knowledge is so vast and you only know what you were exposed to. There may be situations you may not be exposed to in your entire career, right? So uh, it's always good to be humble to know that your knowledge is limited no matter how much you know. It is only a small fraction of the entire knowledge in accounting. I'm not talking about other subjects. Other subjects we don't know anything about. But if I were to put all the accounting knowledge in one box, right, and I have uh, studied accounting at the university for eight years, and I have worked as an accountant for more than eight years, and I have taught accounting for 10 years now, so combining all of that, right, combining all those uh, 26, 25, 26 years of experience with accounting, if I were to say that if I put all the accounting knowledge in one box, I would know less than 10% of what is in that box. You follow what I'm saying? If I, if, if I know 10%, I would think that I, I know a lot, you know, meaning not a lot, meaning I know a lot, meaning that is a good amount. So nobody knows anything, uh, everything. Nobody knows everything. So you will learn you will become an expert about a small uh, portion of the accounting field and you will excel in that field and you will grow inshallah with time. Are you following? So we are going to give you an exposure to the intangible assets in this few slides and not details. I could talk about franchise fee for an entire class period but this is not useful knowledge because you never may face uh, accounting of franchise fees. So what do we do when we test the control risk? We want to know how much expertise and experience the client has in fair value determination. So you want to ask, you want to see how experienced their people are, how expert they are in determining 
the fair value of the intangible asset. The more experience they have, the more expert they are, the better the control is. The better you feel about the control risk. The lower the control risk is, the higher their experience and expertise are. You also want to see the controls over fair value determination. So you want to see how do the experts calculate the fair value determination. Are, is it one man's opinion? Do they have a committee? Do they decide based on market information? What is the process of determining the fair value by the experts, right? The more standard procedures they have, the better you feel. You also want to know the controls over data. You want to see the data they have. It is usually secret data, and you want to make sure that they have proper safeguarding of that data. Okay, you want to make sure that the data is protected. Next, you have segregation of duties between purchasing and valuation. Now, I'll give you an example. You know, we used to help clients do the valuation of the business. So let's say a, a business was purchased, purchase price was $200,000, right? And you have to now determine how much is the fixed asset. So the fixed asset, let's say, was X dollars. The goodwill is going to be $200,000 minus the X. So here now, you have to determine the value of the fixed assets, and then you have to then calculate the goodwill. So you need expertise to do that. The purchase price negotiation should be done by one set of people in your client's business, and then another set of people should have the authority or the, the expertise who, who would do the valuation. So once the $200,000 purchase, purchase price is decided, now another set of people would decide, okay, how much of this should be assigned to fixed asset? and how much of this should be assigned to goodwill. And the assignment of fixed asset is determined based on fair market value. Not the book value, not the cost, but fair market value. So if they purchased a business for $200,000 and you see that the equipment and the furniture and other stuff they have adds to $100,000, that means the goodwill is $100,000. If the fixed assets are only $50,000, then the goodwill is $150,000. So this two activities, the purchase price negotiation and the valuation should be segregated. Why does that help? You have two sets of people. Anytime you have two sets of people doing something, the accuracy and the quality increases. And if the client has engaged valuation specialists, for example, we used to help certain clients and this is outside, this is not an audit engagement. This is with this client, we don't have any audit engagement. We are only helping them buy a business. So we would help them calculate the, the fair market value of the fixed assets and would have to calculate them based on our knowledge and expertise. And then we would ha help them record the goodwill. So if you see that your client has engaged another accountant or consultant who will help them do the valuation, then your feeling about that client's control is even better. You have even lower control risk. Are you following? Are you following the example that I just gave you? Is it clear? Okay. Now the substantive procedure, and again, we will talk about it in general terms. The substantive procedure relate to valuation and impairment. The valuation we just discussed, we want to know the value was determined correctly. And again, we don't have the luxury to go into how the franchise fee is done, how the copyright is done, and how the trademark is done, and nor there is a need, but we need to know we need to check the value calculation, the valuation, how it was done. And remember, you usually don't have to sample here because there are only a few intangible assets and you can look at the valuation of them. 
You also want to see the impairment, meaning since the calculation of the value, has the value declined or has it gone out of, uh, has it impaired, has it become zero? And this can happen for technology, for example, that was patented and they have, you know, all the costs recorded as intangible assets and so forth. But that technology is obsolete. The, nobody uses that and that patent is useless. So you want to make sure that that is not reported in the balance sheet as a high amount. Okay. Some of these items are very easy to value than others. I gave you an example of franchise fee. Very easy because you know the amount that was paid. You know the number of years the franchise fee is good for. On the other hand, the copyright, for example, is very difficult because you don't know how many books they're going to sell or how long the author is going to live because the copyright extends beyond the life of the, the, li the author. You know, So usually in the US, it's author's life plus 70 years, I believe. So um, you have to calculate that, you, you cannot definitely know how long this is going to be. So it's complicated and you can have a debate between you, the auditor and the client's accountant and becomes, you know, hectic if the client does not uh, act reasonably, right? The assertions that we test during the substantive procedures are existence, meaning the intangible asset is actually real and it's not bogus it does it does not exist and we want to make sure that all of them are recorded usually they are recorded completeness is not usually a big issue but again we want to make sure that all of them are recorded we want to look at the valuation the one that we just discussed the value is correct the rights of the intangible asset actually belong to your client and not somebody else. So we want to make sure that it is your client's patent, it is your client's copyright, it is your client's uh, goodwill and not somebody else. And then we want to make sure that they're classified properly. Every one of these intangible assets have a different classification, different accounting treatment. Franchise fee is different than goodwill, right? They have uh, particular lives useful lives and you want to make sure that they're classified under, under the right account and they're amortized over the right period of time okay and again we're talking about it in general terms right uh, some of these accounting issues you're going to learn how to calculate them in your intermediate and advanced accounting classes but here uh, we're not going to discuss them in, in any more detail than what we have done okay so any questions so far? Are you following? Franchise fee? No, not necessarily more common in the movie industry. All of these restaurants that you see have paid franchise fee. Every Papa John's, every McDonald's, every Burger King, every Subway, every Pizza Hut, every Kentucky Fried Chicken, every single one of these individual stores have paid a franchise fee to use their sign and their logo and their menu and all of that, right? So franchise fee gives you the right to operate that restaurant under that name for let's say five years, 10 years like that. Is that clear? Okay, and in addition to using their logo, you have to follow their guidelines, their menu, their uniform, all of that. Is that clear? Okay. Now, uh, how many of you have, first of all, let me just uh, remind you that there is a quiz on Thursday on chapters 12 and 13. Okay? And I want to ask you, how many of you have completed the course evaluation. Let me see how many of you have completed the course evaluation. All of you answer. So Sharat has completed and then Muhammad Nasser and Hamza have you completed or not? 
Okay, so those who have not completed Ali and Mu'tasim and Muhammad al-Jabir, can you please go there right now and complete it and then come and answer yes here. Come and mark yes here. Okay, do it right now and mark, come back and mark yes. Okay, Sharat, uh, you had a question. We'll uh, talk about that in the meantime. So those who haven't completed the course evaluation, please go and complete it now. And there is no response from Hamza or Muhammad Nasser. I don't know if you're listening, if you're just turned on the course lecture and disappeared in the unknown. If you haven't, okay, very good. Now I have answers. So Ali and Motasim and Muhammad Al-Jabir, please go and complete the course evaluation and then come and mark. Yes. All right. Sharat, your question about chapter 13. Slide number 18. Tell me, uh, okay, let me see. Okay. This is the slide. Okay. So it says completeness. Observe the physical safeguards of inventory, review and test clients' procedures for consignment good. Okay, so your question is, test of controls mentions observe of physical safeguards over inventory to ensure completeness, but isn't it ensuring occurrence rather than completeness? Physical safeguards over inventory. So you understand, uh, Sharat, we discuss these management assertions separately under separate titles, but there are overlaps. So we don't necessarily go and do them individually for each assertion. When we are doing them, more than one assertion is covered. You follow? So if in your mind you think that this is only going to do this and not something else, then it, it serves multiple purposes. So in real life, the way it's done is following the checklist. Okay, so the checklist is prepared so multiple assertions are covered. So if you think that it covers more than one assertion or it covers one assertion more than the other, that is possible. You follow? But these are separated, right, based on uh, how the textbook organizes them. Is that, does that make sense? Okay. And that's why, you know, these you know, questions are usually given in short answer format because in multiple choice, you have to, to you know, make a clear cut distinction. And if you do short answer, you can see the explanation of the student and you can see, okay, the student either understands or, or, or does not understand. You follow? All right. Does that answer your question? Do you have any other question? All right. Very good. So I will see you inshallah on Thursday. And those who are completing the evaluation, please evaluate, complete the evaluation and mark yes. And I will see you on Thursday inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.